Welcome to Think Big with Dan and Kasim. Join host Dan Melnick and Kasim Masood as they explore big ideas, limitless possibilities, and engage with visionaries, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who dare to dream big, get inspired, motivated, and find practical tips for personal growth. Think big, dream bigger, and ignite your potential. All right, welcome to Think Big with Dan Costum and our guest today is Tarek. So Tarek, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, tell us where you live and what you do for a living. Yeah, my name is Tarek Dahini. I currently reside in Kansas City, Missouri, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Flex Pro Meals. So can you just tell us more about Flex Pro Meals and, and what exactly it does? Yeah, Flex Pro Meals is a ready-to-eat meal delivery company, Chef Prepared Meals. And uh, we deliver to your doorstep. Yeah, awesome. anywhere, anywhere in the fifty states. Awesome. So, what makes Flex Pro Meals better than its competition? Because you know it's a very competitive space, especially now in twenty twenty three. Yeah, you know it is a very challenging uh, industry and environment. And uh, one of the really, really nice things that we offer is our new customers. We want you to jump in and taste Flex. Flex Pro as quickly as possible. So we do next day air right to your doorstep. So if you if you place your order before 2 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time, you're going to get your order on your door the next day. You know, not many people offer that. Awesome. So how are you able to to provide, you know, high quality meals next day air? And, you know, it, like even are you able to like, you know, keep the cost. I think that like there's a big challenge, right? Because people want convenience and they want health. And they want lower costs. So what does that look like for you guys? Yeah, you know, it's it's hyper challenging. So you have to really optimize, streamline your op- operation to to get the best pricing through really working hard on the way you do your sourcing of raw materials without compromise without compromising quality, because that's 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 typically an area where people like to cut costs, right? We're going to lower our quality, get better pricing, but we don't do that. So it's quality first, then pricing. So we expect to get the best quality and then we negotiate hard uh, for uh, the prices that we want so we can we can pass the value on to our customers and not raise prices on our meals, which we haven't really done. We haven't done it in years. And so um, that's been one of the things that has allowed us to uh, continue to, to add value to our customers is even through the last few years with rising food prices and inflation, we haven't raised our prices. And so we've worked hard on the back end, on the supply chain side, to make sure we're constantly negotiating with vendors so that we can maintain our current pricing to our customers, which is incredibly difficult to do, as you probably have been aware if you go to the grocery store, right? No, yeah, for sure. I was just going to ask that. It's like, what do these negotiations look like? Because I'm sure it's a challenge because their costs for sure are going up. I mean, that's just inflation. Everything is, is getting more expensive, especially when it comes to food. So really, how have you been able to leverage these negotiations in a good manner to not you know pay more and to keep your customers paying the same price even like in the last few years like you just mentioned yeah so you have to be proactive and so one of our values uh at flex pro is to be proactive with a purpose and so if we we take that to heart and so we're constantly and actively researching vendors not just domestically but globally and we're constantly sampling products uh either in our r d labs testing them out, making sure that they meet our quality specs, whether it's food, packaging, shipping material, it doesn't matter. We are constantly inviting vendors to conversations with us. We're letting them know, here's our volume, here's our growth rate, which is exceptional. And if they want a piece of the pie, they're going to have to, they're going to have to show us what they can do for us. And then we always go three, four deep on every vendor and you have to keep qualifying. So it's not a, you start doing business with us and then you have it forever. Good old boys club. That That's a thing of the past. You have to continue to offer value to us. We will pay our bills on time and we're going to pass that value on to our customer and all of us get to grow together. So how do you make sure that year after year that all your vendors are meeting this high standard that you have at Flex Pro? So we don't. So one of the key things that we do is we don't look at a year in, in terms of twelve months. So a flex pro year is ninety days, and so we do end of end of year reviews, which is really end of quarter reviews, and then we talk about our targeted goals for the following year, which is the next ninety days. We have four years within a regular calendar year, and so we're constantly reviewing. 
And then we determine, uh, you know, is the vendor uh, fulfilling their obligations from a reliability standpoint, from a pricing standpoint? Are they working hard to make sure that they get best pricing from their raw material suppliers so they can continue to do business with us so that we can continue to add value to our customer? And so they self-eliminate when they don't do the work on their end because we have people signing up on wait lists to participate and partner with us because our growth rate is extreme. So we've been doubling year over year. And I'm not talking about like doubling from a position of 500,000 a year and now we're a million. Now we're one. Well, I'm talking like, you know, 20, 40, 80. But no, yeah, that's awesome. So in terms of, you know, obviously COVID was very challenging. All these, you know, especially like in the food industry, all these items were in back order. It's very hard to get products. So how are you able to navigate through COVID and to come out on top back in 2020? So you have no control over what another company is doing in relation to what was going on during the pandemic, right? Uh, you have no control over that. So the best thing you can do is make sure that you're cold calling, you're getting in front of it, that you're making sure that your database of potential vendors is deep. And so that you're in front of them continuously to make sure that when you're getting so that you're the first on their list to service you. And if they can't because of whatever's going on in their business, you have a backup, a backup, a backup. Right. And you, you already have those warm relationships in the pipeline. And you're also making sure that you don't give you know one or two vendors all of your volume. Right. And so really, you need to really think about restricting your number one vendor to 60, maybe 65% of your possible volume. And so that your secondary vendor and your third vendor, they have reasonable volume to keep them constantly interested with an understanding that they can be the number one vendor at any time based on their choice. So if they come back to you with better terms, better pricing, then the number one vendor can move to the two slot or the three slot. And they know that the other vendors exist and it's a highly competitive landscape. Since we moved to that format, it's very transparent. I really I really don't want more than three. I'm gonna have a one, two, three, maybe a 60, 30, 10 by volume. And anyone can grab it at any time because I don't know what's going on in your business. And at any time you may need me to be your, uh, to cover your overhead at a low margin and grab margin with a lower volume customer somewhere else. Or you may need me to be that margin guy and I have a lower volume with you. And that's okay too, as long as you meet the minimum requirements. So I make sure that I control what I can and then they can come to the party and show up if they want. But I always have two or three vendors in the background chomping at the bit. I'll let you know when we're ready to bring another vendor on. Oh, and by the way, we grew another 50% last month. Right. So what would you say is the biggest challenge that you're facing right now in the business? Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, hyper growth companies uh, struggle in lots of different ways, right? And so at the start of the year, we had a small manufacturing building. And in December, between December and January of this year, we grew 63%. So we had our sales projection. And then I had my kind of my safety capacity projection over that. I'm like, okay, you know, when was the last time, you know, sales guys got that right? Not only did they blow the sales projection out of the water, they exceeded my capacity. And then I had to scramble. And so we were in a position where it's like we're totally outgrown our building and we need we need a different solution. I knew it was coming, but I thought I had three flex pro years before that that arrived. Right. But it arrived much quicker than I thought. And so the options were uh, buy Lisa building um, and then have to retrofit it to our manufacturing needs. That takes a lot of time or find another company to do co-packing and have them produce our surplus volume so our sales team doesn't have to slow down. And so the third option, which just came out of nowhere, the owner calls me and says, hey, Tark, let's acquire another company. And my first question was, what kind of building do they have? And so we took a look at the building. I said, this is perfect. We can bring just a little bit of capital to get it Flex Pro ready, but they spent all the money on fitting out the manufacturing environment. And then we're going to we're gonna take that company's brand. We're going to run with two brands, but the real thing that we really needed was that building. So in less than 30 days, we took over that company. We took the building, uh, retrofitted it for Flex Pro, and we were up and running, doubling our capacity overnight. It's incredible. So- in terms of this acquisition, like, you know, like you talked about growth, like, you know, what was their customer base in terms of when you took it over? Or was it more of just that they weren't so big, but they just had the capacity to help support your growing customer base? Yeah. So the company we took over, that customer base is different than FlexPros. And so it was an opportunity 
uh, to not only just expand FlexPro's footprint from an increasing our capacity um, standpoint and solving a big problem for us, but it also gave, an, uh, gave us an opportunity to explore a different segment of the market and then experiment with a brand that has really good brand equity in the marketplace. And so now we're running with two different brands, two different price points. The brand that we took over is, is a higher premium price point. And so it gave us an opportunity to start experimenting with developing recipes and food for a different segment of the market, which is great, right? Because now we get to grow two brands, grab more market share. We have the facility that allows us to do that. We can double our output. And so we're in a position to double again this coming year. Exciting. So what strategies is FlexPro using to scale? Because you mentioned this exponential growth. So is it more just word of mouth or lots of advertising? I mean, really, what does that look like in terms of growth? Yeah. So, you know, the industry is driven by uh, marketing dollars, right? We want to get, uh, we want to grab the attention of customers through social media networks, right? And then uh, and then they purchase. And there's lots of companies out there and everybody's trying to grab attention. Well, in order to grab attention, you need dollars. Well, where do those dollars come from? In our industry, the majority of marketing dollars comes from investment. And so then the number one key metric everyone measures success by is uh, cost per acquisition. And then how long do you need that customer stay on in order for you to get an ROI, so lifetime value customer, right? So that's kind of the game. So the thing that sets us apart is we don't have investors. So we generate a lot of cash that is through operational savings. So the way that we run our operation is super efficient. We maximize the amount of cash flow that gets freed up to marketing. And then it's, it's a perpetual growth funnel. So all those dollars go to marketing. We keep, we keep increasing our marketing budget month over month over month. And the way that we've set it up is it's perpetual, never ending. So we can keep growing. Because the market segment is huge and we're, we could just grab a tiny, tiny percentage of it. So our strategy can continue, you know, for, for the foreseeable future without a whole lot of tweaks um, as is. Now, that doesn't mean we're not we don't have other things in the work, but we know that our current strategy, uh, we can definitely double again. Can you just talk more about the operational? So I would say that's like, you know, more of your expertise, but like, what is what does that look like? You know, because I think that many companies, whether they're you know, have you know investments or not, they're not good at managing money. So how has that looked like for you to be successful, save money, invest it back into marketing? Yeah, you know, uh, it, it's incredibly challenged. So when, when I came aboard with FlexPro two years ago, I had 30 people in the operation. I had no seasoned leadership. And even though I had a cool title, there was no one between me and the front line, really, right? And so step one is to identify who do I have on the current team that can manage the business as is, and then how can I free up dollars as quickly as possible to begin building a leadership team that will help me manage the company that I have today. And I don't know which one's coming first, the extreme growth or the leadership team that helps you manage the growth, right? Because if you grow faster than you have leadership in place, then you're wearing lots of hats. You drop things, right? Uh, you have a leaky bucket because you just can't manage that much stuff. And so actively managing both, reducing costs, managing costs, you know, uh, negotiating with vendors, getting that basic stuff in place, training our in-house people that we had, giving them an opportunity to see what they can do. A lot of these folks are on the floor, you know, $15, $16 an hour employee. Hey, are you interested in leadership? Because you don't have to, you don't have to have a degree to be successful in this business if you're ambitious and you're willing to learn and be humble. And so we made sure we gave opportunities to those folks. We have several people who have risen up in the Flex Pro ranks and doing really well. And then we brought in uh, middle managers and then senior level, director level uh, managers who are seasoned operations folks who can help build out the infrastructure. Because when you're dealing with a hyper entrepreneurial com company that is going from startup to mid-level at lightning speed, your processes and systems aren't well developed. And so you need to operate from a position of experience, which we were lacking of, lacking, right? And so we went from a team of 30 in less than 18 months, a team of 30 to 200, which is a lot, right? And there's a lot of people to teach, train, no SOPs. You know, everyone's a short timer. If, you, if you've got more than eight months, you're a veteran at FlexPro, right? We just grew so fast. And so those growing pains are really difficult. And what happens is 
spending increases, right? We're talking millions of dollars in spending. And a lot of the folks making those decisions aren't very experienced. And so there's inefficiencies there. And so as you bring in more experienced people, you can begin building the right processes, approvals, and systems so that you reduce the spending in wrong areas. Now, keep in mind, we're doing everything right. And we have all this leaky buckets from inexperience going on, which is wild, right? So the opportunity is huge. So that's been one of the biggest challenges. And just to illustrate it, our growth rate is so sufficient during the acquisition, moving into a new building, I uh, my eye kind of shifted from um, probably the area that I really needed to focus on, uh, which is typically is really spending, right? I always keep my eye on spending. New team members, new layers, right? Direct level mid-management, but we're talking less than a month, two months on the team. They're still like, you know, getting to know what's going on, but they're almost at the end of a flex pro year, right? 90 days. And, but during that time, uh, I lost, I lost two months negative. Like we, I, I, our spending was crazy and out of control, which in a non-investor company in this industry can be fatal, right? And so gathering up our new team, and sitting down and saying, hey, we don't have all the approval processes in place to manage, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in single purchases, you know, and so everyone needs to be mindful one, and we need checks and balances in place. So with a new team, you know, you really got to dial in the checks and balances at every level. And then I work primarily with our directors to control sections of the P&L. And then it's granular, it's details, right? It's daily check-ins on how are we spending? Let's do the coaching with our new procurement people, our new planning people. Let's make sure that they understand why they're making those decisions versus just print, just pressing send on a PO and ordering stuff they may or may not need. And then making sure that the plan syncs up with, with the procurement and making sure that the production floor is making stuff in the right rhythm according to the plan so that everything can sync up. And so June, July, we weren't synced and we lost, lost those two months. But it, within two months, we were back on track and we'd made up for that month. But the key difference is now I have some flex pro seasoned leaders at 90 days and we're moving ahead with our plans at lightning speed. And so it's, uh, it's been, it's been an absolute adventure keeping up with the sales team. We never want to hold them back. We always want to make sure that they can sell as much as they want. But by by making sure that the way we spend money internally, the way we negotiate, <clears throat> we go off the pennies, right? We don't leave anything on the table. $500 is everything. Because if you take care of that, you don't have to worry about the millions. They're there, right? And then by doing that, operations really is a part of the sales machine. It generates surplus cash flow to the marketing team on schedule every month. And so they can continue to grow. Cool. I don't know if you that responsive to your question? Yeah, well, I was just going to ask you. So, like, I know that you're in operations, but you know, in terms of budget, like, are you approving or managing like the marketing budget? Do you look at like the return on like, an advertising spend, or do you make sure it's efficient, or is that you know not even your domain? You say, hey, listen, like, I'm going to put this money towards marketing; they can handle it. Like, what does that look like for you? Yeah, so I have visibility to it. Uh, talk, we talk about it every week. Um, I make sure I understand where the marketing team wants to go. I understand how much money they have available and I want to make more available to them. And then in the background, I will champion them all day long. If they're hitting their metrics, you know, you, you just keep going. The money's there. You keep dialing it in. And if you can, if you can maximize your return on ad spend um, at the right ratio, then you just keep knocking it out of the ballpark. And so I partner with our marketing director. He's responsible for the spend. And then I make sure that I'm a, I'm a good partner in, in making sure that those resources are available. But I also need to make sure I understand the way we're marketing. I understand the marketing metrics so I can understand if we're moving in the right direction because ops can't turn on a dime. And if there's a downtrend in, in return on ad spend, I need to know because I got to back up. And so we're always looking at understanding the, the trend between our marketing spend and new customer acquisition and return customers. I have to understand how that works. So I can make sure I'm tuning ops either up or down accordingly, because it takes me a little longer to to turn on that dime, right? Yeah. So how often like, are you meeting with your marketing team? You said it's typically once a week. Yeah. So as a leadership team, FlexPro meets weekly. We discuss uh, senior level uh, data and metrics across all departments. And it's an opportunity for all the leaders in the company to sync up with each other and support each other. 
and make sure that if like if there's something I'm not doing from a service side, like let's say there's a shipping issue, it's an opportunity for our, our customer service relations director to really get on my case. And it's OK. Right. I accept the feedback. If I'm screwing up, you just let me know because we trust each other. And I know that you have the customer at heart and whatever you're letting me know is an opportunity for me to go back and say, hey, how are we serving our customers? Because that's ultimately what matters. Uh, you know, they pay a lot of money for the service that we give them. We got to make sure it's as perfect as possible. For sure. So, in terms of your customers, are is FlexPro only a B two C play, or is it like a B two B component, or what is that? Well, like, I mean, like, I don't know, like if you've explored selling to corporations, for example. Yeah, so we're predominantly uh, B2C, right? Uh, direct to consumer, and we do a little wholesale uh, with companies. I'm around the country. It's not a huge part of our business. It may be in the future, but the market size for direct to consumer is so big, it's not being served. The demand is massive, right? And we want to make sure we're getting it right because that's what we care about. You know, our mission is to innovate how you eat. And so we're constantly working with our customers, trying to understand our customers' uh, needs so that we can refit, retool. Uh, our our offerings for them so they keep coming back again and again. Makes sense. So obviously now in 2023, there's a big movement to utilize AI in the business world. So are you currently using AI at FlexPro? And if not, what are some of the use cases where you think the AI could come in and really help your business? You know, it's 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 a buzzword right now, right? People are trying to figure out how to use it. And it's incredibly powerful, amazing technology, right? But the question I would ask myself is, are we using the data that we have right now? Because if we're not, then how's AI really going to help us? And how many companies are really diving into just the boring, basic metrics of sales um, movements by SKU? Are they trending out that basic stuff? Do they understand their forecasting models? You know, are they accurately uh, recording yield? Um, are they tracking inventory accurately? Most companies aren't even touching the word excellence when it comes to any of the basics. And so if companies jump ahead to AI, the only thing that AI will do is it will supercharge the current system that you have. And if you're not in the realm of excellence, it's only going to magnify everything that you're doing wrong at an accelerated rate. And it will create misdirection and you won't know why you're not doing really well. And so while I really want to utilize AI at some point, I know I got to get my core forecasting systems down. We're doing an, um, you know, an enterprise resource planning tool integration right now with new accounting software. Once that is fully integrated and our team has proven that they can use those tools at a very high level, they've mastered those tools. At that point, AI can supercharge it like nobody's business. And yes, at that point, we will definitely be utilizing it. Makes sense. What would you say is your top business priority now going into the end of Q4 here in 2023? So there's really there's really two folds, right? And so, um, you know, we've grown so quickly. We have a relatively new team uh, from direct level down to frontline leadership. It's about time together and really challenging each other and getting through the discomfort of calling each other out respectfully so that we can get to trust as quickly as possible and then polishing the current systems we have in place at every level so that we can predict our performance by measuring it so that the financial resources available to our marketing team are less sporadic and way more predictable month over month over month heading into next year, which will be our greatest growth year. Okay, So we're talking about going to 200 million plus, right? That's our goal. You can't do it if you don't have the basics mastered internally. So it's taken almost two years for me to build um, a cohesive, good team, the right people on the bus that you want, right? Some people have, have left. It's not for them. That's okay. Uh, status quo folks, they need something more stable in the corporate world. That's, you know, companies that are growing at an aggressive 5%. That's for them, not us. We prefer 100 plus. So that's the operational focus so that we can deliver exactly what the customer expects every single time. So that, that's the operational side. On the sales and service side, you know, they're pushing the marketing side, but the part is becoming incredibly important is understanding what the customer wants. And so from that side, our, our core initiatives this quarter is to really dive in 
to understanding what the customer wants so that we can make exactly what they want when they want it. So that next year, our strategies will be centered around that so that we can continue to innovate in the industry and do something others just aren't capable of doing. That's awesome. So what would you say is the one biggest piece of advice that you wish you knew before you started your career? It's something that comes up often. Uh, you know, in operations, there's so many moving pieces. It's so easy to become distracted and ineffective because you're trying to move the needle on so many things simultaneously. You don't do anything well. And so you're just reacting, constantly reacting, reacting, reacting to fires. And so the thing that I've learned in my career that, you know, if I had a, if I had really focused on this at the beginning, it was to learn how to become indistractable, carve out time that no one can break into. And you just got to figure out the when and, and ensure that during that time, that's your proactive time to develop your execution strategies, your short term as they relate to fulfilling your long-term obligation and objectives. And then you're deploying them every day. And it's just a little thing. Today, I'm deploying this proactively because it will help me not have to fight this fire indefinitely, right? I know that by deploying this one little thing, I'll fight this fire for another two months and then it'll fizzle out. And if you can do that daily at the beginning of your career is to learn how to do that, carve out that undistractable time, you can win quicker. <laughs> Take it from me. You want to do this. Makes sense. So if we're going to chat again in one year from now, where do you see things going for FlexPro? Oh, wow. So you're talking four years, uh, four FlexPro years? Four FlexPro years, yeah. Yeah. So I would say, and you can you can call me out on this. Hey, Tarek, did you hit your, <laughs> your mark? You know, we'll definitely be a $250 million company. No questions. Absolutely none. We will hit that target. And then, you know, we'll either have launched two additional brands or acquired at least two more. Awesome. And, and be free. hyper profitable. No awesome. investors. Yeah. yeah be, throw those two in. Being profitable with no investors is extremely impressive, especially in 2023. It's not a common thing. And even more, even more so, it's very difficult to raise money now. But yeah, very, very impressive. And kudos to you guys. So if somebody watching this wanted to reach out, do you mind sharing with, like, you know, your LinkedIn or email? Just best way to get in contact with you. Yeah, best way, message me uh, on uh, LinkedIn, uh, just Tarek Dahini. There's only one of me. It's not that hard to find. And uh, that's the best way. Uh, send me a message. We can connect. I'm open. Uh, I love chatting with people. I also recognize that I'm in this role because a lot of people paid it forward and helped me in my career with no expectation of anything in return. And so I'm always willing to, you know, as as time permits, help other people in their journey. Well, Tarek, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure. And as I said before, we're rooting for you guys at um, Flex Pro Meals. Hey, thanks so much, Dan. All right. Bye. All right. Bye-bye.